It's a horrifying hunting accident. A two-story fall from a tree stand. Was I paralyzed? Could I move? His leg is shattered. To relieve the pain, I needed to line the bones back up. It's a battle against injury and nature. Rattlesnakes, cottonmouths. I have no idea where he is. A family waits and hopes. I was afraid that he was paralyzed. Forced to rely on his own medical training and an iron will, it's an excruciating fight to survive. In the wild, when things go bad, they go bad fast. Without warning, your life can hang by a thread. Adventurer and survivor Craig DiMartino fought back from his own wilderness disaster to reclaim his life. Now Craig meets other courageous outdoorsmen who beat the odds and return from their own fight to survive. Hi, I'm Craig DiMartino. I'm a perfectionist when it comes to my climbing gear, making sure every rope and carabiner is in perfect working order because my life could depend on it. Dr. Joe Bumgardner inspected his tree stands for wear and tear prior to every hunting season. What he didn't anticipate in one of these routine checks was a compromised commercial weld, the resulting 22-foot free fall, and having to use his own medical knowledge to save his life. Dr. Joe Bumgardner of Starksville, Mississippi, had been an avid sportsman and hunter for many years. But he discovered his true outdoor passion in 1986. Hey, Dad, look what I got. When his young son wow. showed him a mail order bow and arrow. Yeah, I just got in the mail today. My 12 year old son says, Dad, I bought this and I want you to sight it in for me and help me tune it. At the time, I had no idea what tune meant. Joe was a renowned surgeon, and he approached the challenge with his typical precision and dedication. With my compulsive, obsessive, surgical personality, I wanted to learn. So I did, and eventually bought a bow myself. We learned together, we still bow hunt together. It's something we can do one-on-one -on -one and have quality time. Joe grew passionate about bow hunting for game, as well as competing in 3D target competitions. Archery is something you can do irrespective of your chronological age, where you're uh, six years old or you're 76 years old. Joe feels like most outdoorsmen, that the appeal of the hunt is not just about harvesting game. When you're out, you're hunting by yourself. What is that draw? What is that connection for you? Well, doing my active practice, Craig, uh, I was on call pretty much 24 hours a day right. until I had a weekend that I was off. When I did get off, I liked to be outdoors, enjoying nature to myself, no phones ringing, quiet, uh, solitude. I'm not a hermit, but it doesn't bother me a bit in the world not to talk to somebody for a full day. For years, Joe was part of a group of 10 outdoorsmen that leased prime hunting and fishing land in northern Alabama. When I first started hunting on our current 3,000 acre lease, I found that there were several areas that were conducive to seeing deer, so I started putting out fixed position stands and I eventually had 40 of them. Having a height advantage is something Craig enjoys too. One of the things I love about climbing is being able to get up high, get up locked into nature, you're alone, you're having fun, you're in a beautiful spot. Is that what draws you to, to tree stand hunting, to be up in a tree, way up in the tree, um, out in the middle of nowhere? I like to be at an elevated position and right. have a better uh, idea and preparation for the oncoming game for my bow shot. Also gets me above their scent level so that I'm not detected. And when I'm up higher, I can get away with motion and not being detected. As a surgeon, Joe understood the importance of attention to detail. And he applied that same meticulous care to his gear, his weapons, and his tree stands. I had a ritual that I actually spent a week or two prior to the season going to each individual tree stand. I would go and I'd spec for growth of the tree that made the ropes too tight. I'd spec for rust. I did not worry about Joe a whole lot because I knew that he was a very careful person. Of course, I did not like the fact that he was climbing trees but that was something that he wanted to do. Friday, September 24th, 2004, was just another ordinary day of inspections. By 2.30, 
Joe had already serviced three positions. He wanted to get a couple more done before heading home around 6 p.m. But he would never rush his process. I never touch a stand to work on it until I have my four-point harness system on and my linesman safety belt attached and around the tree. It was a safe system, except for one major oversight. From the time one leaves the ground until one is in the stand, the safest thing to do is to be attached to the tree with a linesman belt. But unfortunately, uh, I did not do that. No matter how careful you are, there are always unforeseen moments when disaster can strike. As I reached around the tree to hook it in, one of the wells failed. The ladder just gave way, ah! dropping him to the ground. Dr. Joe Bumgardner was repairing a tree stand 22 feet in the air when suddenly a spot weld on his ladder ah! failed. Immediately, his medical training kicked in. After I hit, it didn't completely knock all the air out of me. I didn't lose my breath. It just obviously stunned me. And I took a moment to assess my neurological function. Was I paralyzed? Could I move? And sure enough, I could move my hands, I could move my fingers, I could move my head and neck. That was the good news. But Joe continued to evaluate his condition. I looked at my feet and my left foot was pointing to the sky. My right foot, however, was parallel to the ground, pointing at 90 degrees to my left foot. So I knew that I had a fracture somewhere. And I found, indeed, the femur was actually fractured in my right leg. Then the pain kicked in. I started getting nauseated. And a grim reality. And I realized to relieve the pain, I had to uh, realign the fractured bone so that the muscle spasm would be alleviated. A break of this nature could lead to severed arteries and deadly consequences. The bones had to be reset. When my bone femur fractured, it fractured and displaced such that it had shortened. I needed to get it back in position. It would take all the strength and courage he could muster. I actually was able to take my good foot and put it on the top of my fractured foot and push. As I pushed down, the actual shortened muscles allowed it to line back up. Then it popped into place. Waves of pain and nausea followed the excruciating procedure. Joe fought to maintain consciousness and keep a clear head. He knew his next challenge was to immobilize the shattered limb. He had no first aid supplies, only his tools. I had an extended saw to prune limbs. I had a hacksaw. I had rope. I had a knife. In a feat of remarkable ingenuity, he devised a rig to stabilize his leg. He freed the tree stand ladder. Next, he cut off the protruding pieces. Finally, he sliced three foot pieces of rope. He laid the ladder section alongside his leg and used the ropes to bind it to the makeshift splint. He had succeeded in securing his leg, but that wasn't his only medical problem. Lots of other things could be happening. What's going through your head at that Absolutely, point? Absolutely, Craig. I knew the potential dangers right. of a deacceleration injury when I fall 22 plus feet. Uh, a ruptured spleen, mm -hmm. uh, lacerated liver, some internal injuries that I was not aware of at the time. Since there was no cell service in the woods, Joe had left his cell phone in his truck. And nobody was expecting him home until that night. Joe was on his own. I then thought, well, I've got two options. I can either stay here and wait for a rescue uh, effort, or I can actually see if I can make it back to my four-wheeler, which was only about 60 to 75 yards away. It seemed possible, even if it meant dragging his broken body across a minefield of fallen trees. I started pulling myself along on the ground, which I could do. 
when I got just a little bit from my point of impact, there was a large tree that was down that I could not get up and over. So I knew plan A wasn't going to work. And Joe didn't have a plan B. His only hope now was that someone else did. After falling over 20 feet from a tree stand, Dr. Joe Bumgardner, keeping a clear head, used his medical knowledge to stabilize a badly injured leg. Next, he attempted to crawl to his ATV, which was more than half a football field away. When I got to a blocking tree that was down, I realized I could not return to my four-wheeler. So I actually crawled back by pulling myself on the ground back to the actual impact site to hopefully plan B, which would be a rescue effort, to locate me. I've not uh, actually been out there to look at that uh, stand site uh, since uh, I fell a decade plus ago. Let's go take a look. We'll see if we can locate it. Mm -hmm. Joe took Craig back to the site of the horrific accident. Well, this is it, Craig. Wow, it's a long way. There's still some remains here. The tree that was housing my tree stand, it snapped off up there, and here's the actual tree stand. It's still attached to the tree with the chain. You can see this particular section of the uh, stick ladder is missing. This is the one that I was able to utilize as a splint to- So you made the splint from here down. That's correct. When you're laying out here by yourself, you know your wife, Mita, is home. She doesn't know what happened to you. What are you thinking about now? She's gonna have to go the whole night worried about you. I knew when I didn't call between 6 and 6.30 and certainly by 7 o'clock, she would be concerned. I was okay for a little while, but when it got past an hour and he had not called, I knew that the cell service was poor, but he should have been driving home by then. Mita called her neighbors, Hal and Joyce Polk, for help. Hi, Joyce, this is Mita. Mita called my wife and said, I think I, think I have, have a problem. problem. That Joe hasn't come and he hasn't called. So immediately we came and picked Mita up. Mita and the Pokes rushed to the hunting camp. And went to the area uh, where his, his, his camp is located. Joe's truck was still there. I did not want to go alone. This is quite a Joe! wooded area, and I, I had no idea what I would find when I got there. Joe! His cell phone's in there. Maybe we better call the sheriff. I think that's a good idea. I knew I would need someone to help me. They called in the Pickens County Sheriff's Department. No, we're here right now. We're at the camp. His truck is here, and he's nowhere to be found. But at first, the officers dismissed their concerns. My husband doesn't go out juking without calling me. They said he's probably gone juking with someone else from here at the camp. They think he's gone juking. Let me see that. Hal spoke up and said, no, no you, you don't, don't understand. understand. This, this is, is not, not a man, man who goes, goes juking. juking. There's something wrong. There were people with four-wheelers were there in short order, 15, 20 minutes. All right, we got here to go looking for Dr. Joe. We went out this morning to do some tree stand maintenance. Some of the members from the hunting club came. They were familiar, of course, with the property. We're also going to have a helicopter in the air. Every tree stand has to be searched. He might have got hurt on a tree stand. We have no idea where he is. Let's do it. As the hours pass, Joe worried more about his wife's emotional state than his own predicament. When she didn't hear from me, she didn't know the nature of my problem at right. that time. She didn't know if I was injured, didn't know actually if I was still alive. Then I started thinking about a lot of things. What would happen uh, if I was not rescued? This was gonna be my final demise. I 
I'd had a good 62 years. I felt good about what I had done in life, and uh, I really wasn't worried about it. Joe was only going to be out in the woods for a day. He hadn't brought along any provisions or protection from possible predators. There would be several challenges uh, for any individual caught out in the elements uh, that time of year. The temperature can really drop at night. Bugs that may be biting. We have several venomous snakes, rattlesnakes, uh, cottonmouths. As he sat on the ground and waited, Joe became the target of mosquitoes. His only defense was a surgical cloth he used as a sweat towel. sheriff called for assistance from the Tuscaloosa County Helicopter Unit. The helicopter we used had an infrared camera, which is a thermal imaging system, so we thought, you know, we would be able to uh, locate him. Joe saw the chopper pass overhead, but he hadn't brought a flashlight, so he had no way to signal to it. And the dense woods prevented even the infrared camera from spotting him. With not having located Dr. Bumgardner, we basically, we kind of gave up till daylight. At 3 a.m., the search for Joe Bumgardner was suspended for the night. I have to admit that I thought the worst that night, that it could not be good. I was afraid that he was paralyzed or deceased. It was a very long, difficult night. It was probably the worst night I've ever had. After a nightmarish fall from a tree, Joe Bumgardner spent a long, restless night in the woods, immobilized with a severely broken leg. But he was hopeful his ordeal would soon be over. At dawn, the search team regrouped and set out again. The ground search was not effective in, in, in the beginning, uh, mainly because of the terrain and not knowing where to start looking. Finally, the helicopter pilot spotted something. I just radioed to the ground units and let them know where I'd located a four-wheeler. There's a machine. The ground team sped to the location of the ATV. 11 to L1. We found the four-wheeler, but we don't see him anywhere. Keys are still here. Joe! Joe! Hey! Over here! I, I heard, heard him voice. up here. They were able to hear Dr. Bumgardner yelling for help because he was within a close proximity to the ATV. I'm over here! There he is. Joe! They made their way to me, and when they uh, found me, one of the rescue staff people said, boy, are we glad to see you. I reciprocated the feeling and I said, it's a friggin' two-way two street. street. I'm happy to see you too. Let's keep his legs stable. Nice splint. Took me two hours yesterday. Two hours. Hey guys, yeah. gently. Not too late. Don't yeah. hurt. No. Oh. Joe was extracted from the woods with his ingenious splint in place and hundreds of mosquito bites on his body. How you doing, Doc? This I'm good. Go high. He came out on the stretcher. Of course, I ran to him. Take just a minute. We're so glad to see you, Joe. I'm glad to see you, too. He said he was glad to see me, and I was certainly glad to see him. We got to get him to the ambulance. You can follow along. When you got carried out, you got to see Nita right away. It was so relieving to let me know that she was no longer going to have to worry about me. Plus, it was all, all completely revitalizing to see that smile on her face when she knew that I was still alive. Joe was quickly transported to Baptist Memorial Hospital Golden Triangle in Columbus, Mississippi. So we took a look at your x-rays, and you're going to need an operation to fix that leg. Luckily, he didn't sustain any internal injuries. We're going to leave your field splint on until we get into the operating room so I can show the operating crew what a properly applied field splint looks like. The orthopedic surgeon was impressed with Joe's handiwork. 
After four days in the hospital, Joe returned home to what normally would have been a grueling recovery. Joe, be careful on those. You know the doctor told you not to be on your feet yet. He didn't want to use a walker. He was on crutches, and he was going up and down the stairs, and I just knew he was going to fall again. But that's the kind of person that he is. Joe refused to let this experience keep him from doing what he loved. A year later, I was actually back in the woods, back in the archery, back in the bow hunting, and now I do not climb any tree without successfully and properly being attached to that tree from the time I leave the ground until my successful ascent back to the ground. And as with most stories of survival, there comes deep reflection on what is truly important in life. One of the things, having gone through all this, you, you seem like you have this second chance. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of things in life we reassess only after, unfortunately, we lose that asset. Right. Our health is one of them. Right. Our family is one of them. Our security. Uh, once those uh, things that we take for granted are temporarily taken away from us, and once it's restored, we have a new life of appreciation right. for that entity that was taken away from us on a temporary basis. I feel the same way about my fall. Now that I'm fully recovered, back to the lifestyle and quality of life, I want to share my experience with other the people, and if in any way I can prevent them from having an accident that is preventable, then I feel like it's my obligation to share my experience with them. There's no question Joe is a very lucky guy in the way that he hit the ground. But his training as a surgeon was invaluable. He knew exactly what he needed to do, and he had the guts and the fortitude to do it. Tree stand falls are the leading cause of hunting injury in this country. Check out your tree stands. Wear your safety harness. Accidents can and will happen, but you can decrease the odds and make sure your next hunting trip doesn't become a fight to survive.